Good afternoon, everybody. And I know I have a lot of competition in the other rooms with Matthew Wilcox and Karen Chandler, and I'm happy, very happy that you made it. Um, I also want to be in the other talks. So. <laughs> this is actually the first, I don't know if you know this, the first Blue Hackers talk at LCA. They've been boffs. There haven't been actual talks. That's because it's a bit of a tricky subject, and the gang didn't actually trust anybody to, to take that on until now. So that's, that's really good. Um, so I submitted this talk for LCA, not actually expecting it to be accepted, of course, but in the end it was because there was a free slot and I was asked to do this at the last minute. And I figured it would be a good opportunity because Blue Hackers is now about 10 years old. Um, so let's, let's briefly review where we, where we come from. And then I've got some more to say about where we are now and where we want to be going, um, because it might actually be of interest to uh, many of you. Um, and of course, there's the recording and the live stream recipients. So uh, for that as well. First of all, how did, how did we start? Just for those who, well, who was there in OSTC, at OSTC 2008? Anybody? I was there. Okay, you went there. So um, I'll, I'll tell you what, what happened. Um, so OSTC, o Open Source Developers Conference, um, was in Sydney in 2008. And as usual, <laughs> Worn a button shirt. Okay. Pardon me, I'll just wrap this up properly so I won't hit it again. Then I can walk and wave my arms around. Okay, now we're good. Um, so in 2008, there were the lightning talks as per usual at the end. And I was pondering do I want to get up? Do I not want to get up? And I thought, yes, I'll, I'll do this. And as the very last um, lighting talk, I got up on the stage and I very simply said, well, anybody else here or who here has been dealing or is dealing with depression, anxiety and, and stress? And I stuck my hand up. And of course that caught everybody surprise, surprise. So before they actually had time to think about it, they actually, many people actually stuck their hand out and, and I said, well, good. Now, now look around you. You're not alone. And I walked off. Um, so it was a bit of, of self-therapy for me. Um, I'd been dealing with those things and, and was still dealing with those things. And um, it was a bit of self-therapy, but also an attempt to at the same time help others. As one of the key things with particular depression is that you think you're alone or you're not, you're, you're, what you're experiencing is, is you know, different from what anybody else experiences, which to a point is true, but many things are the same as well. And, knowing that you're not the only one is actually really, really important, obviously. So making that a bit more visible is a nice idea, but also um, making people aware about what's going on around them. And I don't know what the actual percentage was, but it appeared, it appeared like about half the room actually stuck their paw up, which may well be true because of the particular um, tech space that we're, we're in. I don't know, I mean, you know, it could have been 30% or 20%, but it looked like an awful lot of people. And after that, first of all, someone ran up to me and, um, and said, hey, great, um, good thing you reminded me. I, I forgot to, to pick up my meds from the, from the pharmacy and ran off. <laughs> that was score number one. Um, secondly, I got a couple of thank yous, which is always nice. Um, and, um, you know, I didn't actually expect anything, to, anything more than that to happen. There wasn't any other intent with it. It was really a spur of the moment idea. So, um, you know, that, that is basically what it's about. But what happened next? Um, I'm not opposed to, you know, sticking my head, head out at some point and, and doing things, as you know, and, and also, um, you know, organizing things. That doesn't matter. I'm okay these days with getting up on stage, and that's the difference between me and many other, other geeks. Um, as long as I'm comfortable with what I'm talking about, I'm okay being up here. Um, I used to be a very shy little nerd long ago who was not happy with being on stage, now I don't mind. So I thought, well, if that benefits other people, I'll make use of that, that'd be cool. So what do we do then? Well, within a couple of days, we made up a name and did up a website thing, um, which now contains a blog, a how-to, 
um, and the how-to is like a manual for us fellow humans, um, which you may want to have a look at sometime. It may contain some, some interesting ideas that you like. And predominantly those are ideas that I've applied to myself, but other people have also contributed to that, including feedback and contributions from professionals in the field. So that's quite useful. Um, references, that is links and, and other information for external resources, both in Australia as well as some internationally. And of course, there's the Twitter, there's the Twitter account, Blue Hackers, um, Blue Hackers Org. Um, and then there's the stickers. So the stickers was the next actual, you know, real world thing that we, that we did. Um, so OSTC was in November 2008 and LCA 2009 in Hobart was in January, as usual. So it was about, you know, two months later. So I got two rolls of stickers organized. Um, very last minute, I actually got them printed in Hobart. <laughs> and the ink was literally not quite dry. Um, so I managed to, to nab someone to, to actually pick up the stickers from the, from the printing place and, um, and grab them. So we had, I don't even remember how many hundred, but a couple of hundred stickers at the time. They weren't fabulous, particularly because they were done in such a rushed way. So I think they delaminated themselves and, and so on. I hope nobody requires those. I don't know if anybody had any, but I, I, yeah, you did. <laughs> they know more, are they? they? They just, yeah, they are no more. But they were a good start. Yeah, you have to start somewhere. You know, that wasn't good enough at the time, and we didn't know they were going to do that. So, um, yes. So the idea of that was, let's put one of those on, on preferably, for instance, your laptop, and there should be one here, right there. Put it in the corner. And it's just a, it doesn't mean anything about you in particular, other than uh, about how you yourself feel. It is a quiet show of support for other people. It is that look around you, you're not alone thing. It is that simple. Um, and that is pretty much the main thing that we have been doing since. And it's actually done marvelously well. Um, I'll, I'll get back to that. So. Along the way, I, I read more books. Uh, one of my hobbies and the profession that I didn't pick is psychology. So um, I've been involved in that for, for decades, obviously, and I know a fair bit about it, but let's be clear, I'm an amateur, right? Um, but I've read a fair bit, and I've actually adapted a um, works of Martin Seligman, who's done a lot of work in the area of depression, and I'll explain a bit about him. Um, into, a, into a, a kind of board game that, that might actually help um, people in, in the blue hacker space. So Martin Seligman is a very special fella. He um, is kind of the father of, um, oh, what's it called? Um, yes, but there's a, there's a therapy name. Um, it will come to me again. Um, anyway, what he's been working on, in particularly later with kids, is the idea of, well, similar to how we eradicated other infectious diseases over time um, by inoculating part of the population, could that be done for depression? What, what approaches could you take with young fellow humans to actually safeguard against them later developing depression. A very interesting thought, right? It's not exactly a contagious disease, but there are aspects that might, that might still fit. You know, you can debate that, but you understand what I'm saying. There's no germ that, that goes from, from a to person A to person B. Um, as it turns out, by the way, it does work. Um, with the, the rough story is that if kids are comfortable with themselves and, um, you know, by thereby, for instance, being less vulnerable to bullying attempts, that kind of thing, um, there's less chance they will develop depression later. There are other chemical, chemical is issues and aspects. It's not foolproof, but it actually reduces the risk significantly. So that's really cool. Um, the game uses a similar approach, and it has been play tested, um, and it does actually work. The problem is, I don't know, have, have any of you participated in the play tests? No, we've done this at various conferences since. So um, it's still a work in progress, and there's problems with the end of it. 
it doesn't wrap up <laughs> cleanly. There have been a few attempts and iterations and we're not quite there yet. It looks really pretty. It was done, the artwork was done by Josh Bush, um, who lives in, in Tasmania as well, um, in Launceston, I believe. And um, anyway, we'll, we'll get there. So it has a board, it has some things that walk around, uh, a couple of dice, and, and cards. And there's different sets of cards for adults and for children. So they can play on the same board, but the questions they get asked, the tasks they have to do, are actually slightly different. Um, I won't go into that further, just making you aware it does exist. If you have experience with developing board games, um, I would love to <laughs> tap into your expertise and actually get this finished. I haven't had a lot of time in recent years, but I'm actually quite eager to just get this out there because unfinished projects annoy me and I think this is worthwhile. Um, we've also had, I've also had feedback from professionals that it can actually be quite useful. It can actually be a, let's bluntly call it a, a, an informal therapeutic tool. Okay, it can be used with people who see professionals uh, and whether in a school setting or, or at private um, professional settings. Um, that can actually be quite helpful also inside families. And it's actually still a fun game if you're not dealing with any of it because it makes you think about stuff, but not in a nasty way. It's actually safe. So that's a good thing. Okay, so what else are, have we been doing since? A lot of stickers, a heck of a lot of stickers. And before I forget, this is kind of a reminder to myself, more stickers. However, I always thought it was funny that these come in sheets of 42. Um, six by seven, I, I, it's just a thing, you know, we're, we're in there, it's right. These are absolutely, absolutely the last of my collection. You saw how many there are, that's it. So we've got more than 10,000 stickers out there, which is really cool. Many of them are, of course, yes, on your laptop too. <laughs> um, there are, of course, many stickers out there that are now on dead laptops that were on phones and they rub off. I recommend against it, but leaving it there until your laptop dies works perfectly well. Usually, the sticker survives the laptop. That, that tends to be the case with that. Um, I didn't quite source it locally, but um, in return, we got a heck of a lot of stickers. Um, I actually ordered them from a company in the US because I was going to a US conference anyway and I had them delivered to the conference hotel where I, I was staying. At the conference hotel, I took receipt of the package and saw that it had been sent via um, either FedEx or UPS from Pakistan, where it had been printed. So I thought I was ordering locally to where I was going. As it turned out, it had been half, sent halfway around the world. Well, that's you know, that's the global economy for you. Fine, in any case, we got a lot of stickers out of that, a decent quality, and I'd like to have more. We'll talk about, we'll talk about that. But if you, if you are in need of a sticker, if your laptop doesn't have one, grab one of those. If you have a pair of scissors, cut out a few. Um, that, that works too, otherwise you'll just have to take them off. So what, um, what else have we been doing? Um, so, boffs at... Um, Birds of a Feather sessions, informal sessions, just meeting up um, at most Linux confs and OCCs since 2009. Now, not all of them, because I wasn't always there. In some cases, John Dalton has gracefully um, hosted the meeting. And the format of that meeting was pretty much a, hi, I'm Arian and, and I've dealt with depression. Um, but no, it's not an AA type <laughs> uh, thing. It's pretty much if anybody wants to speak out and tell a little story or, or say something, that is cool. If you just don't want to, uh, if you just want to sit there, that's that's cool too. And um, you know, we've heard some interesting interesting background stories and other things, and so people who just wanted to tell other people what's been going on with their life, and that really helps. That helps each other. So it's not a therapy thing, and you need to be very careful that you don't turn it into a therapy thing. But um, these these sessions, I think, have been quite useful. Um, at some point along the way, I got an email from the US that someone wanted to organize a Blue Hackers conference. And I had a very brief thought about that. And then I said, no, not ever. <laughs> that seems highly indulgent, highly dangerous, and a really, really, really bad idea. Um, so no, just putting it out there um, as far as I'm concerned. But you know, I'm not necessarily in charge. But as far as I'm concerned, I don't think we should ever do that. Um, that's not what it's about. Anyway, there's many other things we can do. Um, what we can do and what we have done is another idea. 
We've had a free psychologist available at LinuxConf in Perth and a free counselor available at the OSTC 2014 in the Gold Coast. So what did we do? We made sure that that person was paid for for a couple of days. We talked with them and made sure that they were geek friendly, as in they, they had experience in talking with geeks, but you know, other than that, they're just professional. Um, and we were talking about, okay, how do you want to arrange your slots? Do you need breaks in between? And so on, what, what, how long do you want your slots? And so on. We'd lay that out. Then we'd create a sheet with sticky notes. And on that sticky note, it simply said blue hackers and a time slot. And we hung out that sheet. And then anybody who wanted a time slot simply grabbed that. So it's a, I don't know, it's a self, it's a self managing anonymous scheduler. Um, very low tech, but it works, right? So you don't need to be online in an app or, or anything, it just works. So we, we've used that twice now and it works actually really well. Um, so what has that done? I'll, I'll get to that in the next slide, I think. Um, along the way, there have been some podcasts, other media, interviews, articles, and, and so on. And again, I'm, I'm happy to talk about these things because I think it helps other people. It's not about me, but it's about you know the issue in general that I want to talk about. So there's been very few very little talk about me personally, because that's not actually what it's about. I, I keep that quite, <laughs> quite distinct. My personal life is my personal life. So, positive impact. Um, Blue Hackers has saved lives, and I think that is actually really, really cool. Um, quite a few, in fact, that I'm actually aware of in different countries, and I think that's really cool. And some people are here today at the conference because of this. So, I think that's excellent. If that's, a if that's one of those outcomes, you know, score. Um, excellent, but thank, thank you, because that's because of all those stickers and things. And yes, I've, I've been the spokesperson, but you know, it is, it's a we, not a me, that, that is that. If one person would not be able to do this. It's more a creating an, an attitude, a feeling, culture thing, okay? Um, so, um, it's also helped people, well, as I mentioned, that, that funny first saga, and hey, I forgot, almost forgot to grab my meds, and of course, you know, your head goes slightly sideways when, when you're not actually regularly taking those prescriptions, because they can be quite serious meds, so it, that's important. So, I think that was slightly before the smartphone, so, <laughs> since it was 2008, so good, good that that helped. Um, I've heard from people that either a talk or, for instance, a conversation um, with um, a counselor at one, you know, one of those conference sessions got people started actually getting professional help, which in some cases is really important, but there's a really big, there seems to be a really big um, hurdle, threshold, to actually getting started with that, talking to someone else about that. And then, of course, it might take some time to actually find a counselor or, or psychologist or other professional that you can actually talk with, because not everybody is the same. You might just not jive with whoever you first meet. So it's a bit of a process, just like in some cases, you know, medication needs to be in the right dose and it needs to be the right medication. It's a bit of a process. So similarly, professionals, they're not all the same. You need the right one. Um, so I've heard back from people that either at the conference, those, those free sessions were a good starting point and that got them going because, you know, they, it was an, a kind of a sudden easy way to get going with it and that got them started and then after that it was easy. I didn't expect that, but you know, whatever. <laughs> That's again positive. Um, and then of course also opening up, up uh, conversations with friends in need um, and, and vice versa. So that, that again, I think is a very positive thing. And in general, the raising awareness, you know, you're, you're not alone and you're not the only one. How many of you here have a Blue Hacker sticker on your laptop? Yes, yes. Well, there's a lot of stickers that need to be picked up then, hey? Yeah, that's good. Um, so, now to get a bit more serious. Mission complete? No, absolutely sadly not. Um, because over the years, other lives were sadly lost and we know some of these people, some of them have been to OSDCs, Linux Comps, and other conferences we've been to. We may have met those people in our workplaces and we know some of their names. Um, but even if we didn't know their names, we know it happened and that's actually not nice. Um, so we've done some good stuff, but there's more stuff to do. Now, I'm gonna talk a bit about the current trends 
in this field. Um, and again, I'll prefix it with the fact that I'm not a professional, but these are done by proper researchers, and I've just napped their nap the data to give you an idea about what's going on and why. Um, and I have some opinions there, which you may or may not agree with, and I've got some ideas, and then a conclusion on what we want to do with it. This is the current trend, well, up to 2014. There's possibly more recent data, but since I only heard about doing this talk yesterday, I didn't actually grab any new papers, just to make sure I wasn't getting stuck in browsing things online. So I've got data up to 2014. Um, the trend is rising slightly, but it's not doing too dreadfully. So young adults are, you know, late teens, but definitely into 20s and beyond, okay? Um, so that's not too bad, okay? Now keep a close eye. That's adolescence. I'll click back. Keep a close eye. Poof. Poof. So what's happening there and when? Hmm? Social media. Okay, let's... <laughs> you're jumping ahead. Well done. But you're not wrong. But what, what's happening and when? No, no, no. Let's stick with the years. <laughs> so what, first of all, what is happening in the graph? What, what is happening? A, a fairly sharp increase, and by the way, it has, it has continued and worsened. The curve is like, yeah? At the very least, you can go straight and you can go up a bit depending on which year and so on. So, yes, it's increased. When did it start increasing? When did it start increasing? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Tinder, Tinder is way more recent. Hmm? 2012 is actually the magic point. Yeah. And 2012 happens to be the exact point of smartphones, not Facebook. Facebook is older. The general availability of the smartphone that we know now, that is the marker. However, that is correlation, not causality. Okay, just, okay. I think there's a cause, a causality, is there, there's a causal relationship there, I think, and many, many scientists would agree with me. Well, I agree with many scientists, obviously. <laughs> they haven't asked me, obviously. But, um, you know, in, in principle, there's just a correlation and not a causal relationship, but, but we can get to that. So let's, let's take a step back. Um, so the general flow in the realm of depression is... I didn't have enough time to make it into a neat circle and so on. There's stress and anxiety, and they actually feed into each other. Yeah? So anxiety causes stress, and stress causes anxiety. And which one came first? That's often very difficult to dissect, and you might not even want to bother. But the point is that if for every reason you are anxious, you're more likely to get stressed, and that is very likely to lead to depression in certain situations. If you are stressed, for instance, in your work environment, home environment, other things happening then that will increase your anxiety in either way. You have a higher chance of actually having to deal with, with depressive issues, and that, of course, deal, works back into the anxiety as well. There's a lot of loops there and, and, and self-feeding things. Um, but the trick is, of course, that if you can avoid stress and or anxiety or lower them, get rid of them, you know, if you can get rid of a stressful job, that would be great. Some, sometimes you can't, but, you know, it's an idea. Um, and if you, through other means, you can reduce your anxiety by working on certain things that just stress you out less, that would be great. So that's a general idea. So that's general cause and effect. We're not dealing with depression directly necessarily. We're dealing with stress and anxiety. That's what I'm trying to point out. If we get rid of stress and or anxiety, the depression issues are much less um, there. They're, they're diminished. Okay. So what we already know, there's a correlation, the rise of the smartphone. Um, since around 2012. Now, that one is fairly well established, that that one is firm. As to whether it's a cause, we don't know. Now, browsing Facebook gives you a bigger endorphin hit than caffeine, nicotine, and cocaine. It works on, and endorphins work on the same section of the brain. And yes, you may look this up. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm happy to hand out the slides later if you want a if you proper 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 thing. And I, I haven't bothered referencing everything, but it is 
it is out there. Um, the reason I haven't done a lot of work on that is just, I just haven't had the time on that. Um, but trust me, I've got the I've got the papers on this lying around. Um, so it works on the same areas of the brain and the endorphins. This is in, in, in actual trials with people getting measured while they're watching Facebook and other. This is not just Facebook, by the way. I'm just using them as the, as the tag here. I'm quite happy to call them out because they're, in my opinion, among the worst. But there's others that have exactly the same effect. We're talking about, you know, Twitter can do exactly the same thing. Um, but, you know, there, there, there's many. Um, it works on the same section of the brain. It does exactly the same thing, and it's measurable. It's endorphins acting in your brain. It's a higher hit than many of these other things, which we actually regard as problematic. We do not feed people cocaine. It just doesn't happen. Yeah? I'm from the Netherlands. Not even in the Netherlands do we feed people cocaine. Yeah? No. <laughs> no, really no. And it's not even legal. I'll just have you know. Um, in, in the Netherlands, it's condoned, which means that if it's soft drugs, it, it doesn't get prosecuted. If it's hard drugs, it gets get prosecuted if you're, well, either way, you get prosecuted if it gets traded. The consumption thereof, being an addict, is not a criminal offense. It's a health problem. And that is a big difference. Okay? So that would be a health problem. We definitely regard smoking as a health issue. Right? We don't just say to people anymore, Go on, go smoking, it's healthy. That used to be the case in the 50s and 60s. Yeah, that, that was actually advertised at the time, but we're long over that. Um, caffeine, we know it's not good for you, and many of us love it anyway. Yeah? I happen to be caffeine-free because I found that it doesn't do anything for me at the time, and it gives me a depressive dip the next morning. It's really not worthwhile. <laughs> so I'm Coca-Cola free, I'm caffeine free. It just, not, it just doesn't happen anymore. I used to drink lots of Coca-Cola. In my teens, at some point, a bottle a day or something. It's addictive, right? Seriously. Um, fortunately, I personally have, I'm very comfortable going to cold turkey on anything. So I could just stop that and that didn't cause me any other damage, which was actually really nice doesn't mean I should be trying any of those things. Yeah? So I'm just staying away from it. Problem solved. So clearly these things are addictive, and that means that Facebook effectively and the other social media is effectively addictive. It has that effect. This is the cause. Therefore, being on Facebook and Twitter actually has a problem. The more you're on it, the more of a problem it is. And once you're addicted, other things start to happen. And we'll, we'll get back to that. Um, so... Then, measuring. Jean Twenge wrote a very interesting book called iGen. It's, it's written about you know, the generation that was born in the late 90s up to now, and she, she tags them as iGen. She's been researching long-term trends in um, the American population, different age groups over many decades. So this is not the first book she's written. She's named them iGen, because they don't quite fit into the Gen X, Gen Y type thing. And she's done for something very specific. Plus, the outcome was quite specific to the online media. Um, so, hence the iGen thing. But it's a bit of a capturing, it's a bit of a tag to, to sell things, obviously. So, what she found was that in her group and talking to people and, and her research, Facebook causes depression. And you might ask, doesn't depression cause Facebook? And the answer is no. Um, <laughs> that's phrased in a funny way. But being depressed doesn't make people use Facebook more. However, people using Facebook more has a higher chance of, of causing, causing depression. And she's pretty much proven that. And you can read the book for her very, very extensive research on this. So I think that is a problem. It is not just Facebook that is the problem, again. But it is a problem. Okay? Now... On to the next step. Kids. They have their phones on all the time. And yes, I've got teenage kids. They range between age 13 and 19. And they're all on them all the time if we let them. Yes, you do? <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, pay attention because you may want to make some notes there. Um, so, very interesting. You can see kids as young as three or four exhibit behavior that is very, very similar to an, an addict. 
as in a drug addict or an alcohol addict, if you try, try and take, if, if you have kids and you have a four-year-old with an iPad or something, or another tablet, see if you can take away their tablet and see what happens next. They will be, there will be screaming, there will be pleading, and if you look up steps, uh, you know, steps of addictive behavior, there are specific steps and they involve, you know, arguing, pleading, shooking in the corner, you know, all those steps are there. And you see the four-year-old act that out. Now, they definitely haven't seen that on TV, they haven't read up. So, this is a natural behavior. Where does that come from? Well, very likely they're addicted. Maybe we should think about that one, <laughs> because I th really think it's not particularly cool to have four-year-olds addicted on anything, other than, you know, parental love and, and, and having fun and, you know, being safe and, <laughs> you know, just exploring the world. That is very good things to be addicted about. Other things, not so much. So, um, I think that's a very serious issue. Then there's something called FOMO, the fear of missing out. And yes, it's a real thing. Um, and I see it with my own kids. So, previously you'd have a, you know, Christmas unwrapping of, of gifts. And, you know, you may, not, you may or may not get the exact gift you wanted, but that's, it, that's there and you, you engage with the other, the other people in the room and it, it just happens and maybe after the holiday you discuss, you discuss with your friends what you got and, and you know, how your holidays were. But it's, it's kind of long past weeks ago, so it's not as, as hot an item anymore. So, what tends to happen now, pretty much within the hour after the unwrapping of gifts on Christmas morning or whenever you do it, um, they're on the phone to their friends, their mateys, and they're sending across photos and, and so-and-so got this and so-and-so so -and -so got that. Well, one person got a nice new book and another person, their parents thought it was a really good idea to give them a new iPhone. Now, it's not about the iPhone, but the disparity between the book and the iPhone is quite clear, yeah, in monetary as well as perceived value. Now, I personally think that the book is worth much more, but, you know, it's, it's this thing and it, it can make someone feel, oh, why didn't I get that? And they don't, maybe if you, you know, you can't necessarily talk sensibly with a teenager, but if you were to have a sensible discussion with them, they might say, I really don't care about that, but I felt left out anyway. That's the feeling of being missing out. It, it might not really matter, but it does, because lots of little things make a big impact on young teens. That's just the way it works. It has to do with lots of hormones and, and the way they work. Plus, in that age group, their primary example of how the world should be and what they want to feel is their friends. They don't listen to parents anymore in terms of, or other adults, in terms of um, what they what, what they like, what they don't like, and so on, they, they're more likely to ask a friend, a peer, to see what they, they feel about things. So if one of their friends starts this, it very quickly ends up in this way. So it's, it's, there's a bit of a group effect, obviously, but that is the way it works at the moment. So FOMO. Um, other effect of people being on their phone all the time, kids in particular, but also adults, is being disconnected from the world around them. Um, when you walk on the street, you see people walking like that. They're not actually seeing what goes on around them. Now, apart from the fact that they might be run over while crossing the street, and this has, you know, this has happened and people have got into trouble. Um, and, you know, you can create interesting, you can play with this, yeah? So there's social psychology and there's things called the group effect. So if you're both, if, if you and a number of other people are standing in front of a, a pedestrian crossing light and the light is red, then obviously everybody stops. When the light goes green, you start walking. Now, what if you, if it's completely empty and you start walking before it goes green? If it's just you, nothing much may happen. Some, one or two people may follow you. If you are in a uniform, people are much more likely to follow you. If you and a couple of others do this at the same time, pretty much the entire crowd, about 80% will follow you. You could try this. Please do it on a, on, a, on a safe road where there's not actual traffic, but you will notice that other people follow you and it'll be worse when they're all in their phones because they're not actually watching the red light. Yeah? It'll be dreadful. So people are actually disconnected from the real world and that may actually not be a good thing. There's lots of interesting stuff going out there, including you know, fellow humans. Um, now, in that research, 
of Gene Twenge, it comes out that if less than three hours a day of screen, let's call it screen time, happens, then it can be compensated for. As in, when the kid does other things like sports, hangs out with the family, friends, you know, doing other stuff, it can be okay. So it, it's kind of compensated. If it's more than three hours, it really causes trouble. As in, depression is one of the side effects, but it's really, really not good, and it's very difficult to then sort that out. Um, yes, question? question? Very quick, because otherwise at the end. Yes? Yes, I would agree with that. The, okay, so the question was, since you don't have a microphone, uh, the, the comment or question essentially is, um, there is a difference between doing different things online. Um, it's, Facebook is not the same as watching YouTube video and so on. True. However, um, it, it very quickly becomes problematic and the number of hours that, that people and kids spend online is so huge that if you remove all the innocuous stuff, you still have way too many hours. And then deciding exactly what the innocuous stuff is and the slightly iffy stuff, I don't know. Is sitting in front of the TV all day healthy? It's probably not a good idea either. We, we have long decided that that's not a good plan, but essentially watching YouTube videos all day is the same thing. It's not exactly the same type of thing, but it is kind of the same thing. So maybe it is similar in a different way. It's not quite as bad as watching Facebook stuff, but it depends on what is on the YouTube videos. If the YouTube videos is how teens should be, should be dressing and behaving, then there's a lot of peer pressure which feeds into the FOMO and, and other anxiety stuff. Oh, I don't look like all those pretty people. Oh, I don't have money to buy those things and so on. It feeds into the same problem again. So a video can be really cool or it can be utterly dreadful and you'd have to dissect the whole thing. I think we can overall say that there's way too much screen time there. And yes, I'm guilty of this too. Yeah? <laughs> I'm not saying I'm innocent there. Um, so essentially, I think it's a recipe for disaster and, and the, um, you know, the experts already said so. So parents and their phones, how about those parents? Pretty much for the kids. Now, that three hour limit hasn't been aimed at them, um, but other than that, you can pretty much take the previous slide and copy it here. In fact, I started doing so and I thought, stuff it, I'll just refer back to the previous one because I've got more to say about it. I've seen parents very disconnected, not just from the outside world, but from their kids' activities. You've seen this too, eh? So, um, you know, you have a sports event, there, the kids are doing swimming, and the parent is on Facebook. The parent is not actually there. And I mean that. If they're not looking at the kid saying, yay, go little Johnny, yeah, they're not there. Maybe they're more quiet, but you understand what I'm saying. If they're on Facebook talking with someone else, there's at the very least an extra person in the room, or a couple of people, or a million people. I don't know how many other people are around them, but it's definitely not, the, the kid is not their focus of attention, which is where it should be. And kids are very aware of that. Yeah, they are very good at, at, at knowing whether someone actually cares for them at that particular moment, point in time. And of course that parent cares, but they're not expressing it, and that's a problem. Um, and you can again see that when you see some adults at restaurants, and you've all probably also observed this, but I'm a people watcher, so I see this maybe more often than you do, or, more, or sooner, they're on their phones, and they're not actually having a conversation. They're each on their own phone, and every once in a while, I say, ha ha, see that? It's like, <laughs> you're not having a conversation. Are you actually out on a date? You know? My wife and I joke sometimes, you know, if one of us has a phone out just to deal with something and say, well, I can get my phone out, we can talk, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a thing now. But we know that and just put the phone away just to make sure that it's, um, that it's not there. In fact, I often leave my phone at home when actually going out on a date and that seems like an excellent plan. I don't need it. Um, so, um, you know, there's very little conversation in those things. So is there a problem? Oh, I think there definitely is a problem there. So I think those parents are giving a hideous example to their kids. I'm not expecting the kids to change their behavior as long as they get that example from their parents who are probably just as addicted to Facebook as their kids are. The kids are not very likely to be on Facebook. They're more likely to be in Instagram and Snapchat and some other things because Facebook is not cool. Um, Facebook has very particular age ranges where it peaks in number of users. 
people in their 60s and 70s are completely into Facebook. Yeah, they stay in touch with their friends and, and from far away even and exchange photos about the family and talk about that. Other adults, many other adults do as well. Um, teenagers and 20-somethings really predominantly do not care about Facebook. They're somewhere else. Nevertheless, that is the kind of, um, that's the kind of image you get. So um, now for the good news. Interestingly, when the, the adolescents become young adults, so late, late teens and early 20s, they actually start putting their phone away. It's quite interesting. You may have seen people around the campus here actually just walking around and talking with each other rather than being on their phone. It's an interesting pattern. It's actually quite cool. So it's not all bad. So many of the teens that were adolescents only a couple of years ago, they actually do get past this. Depend from me, it just, I'm just wondering how damaged are they before they get to that point and could they be in better shape? It's not necessarily dreadful, but maybe it could be better. So in any case, there's, there's hope. So the self-regulatory effect of just kids doing their thing, it does sort itself out to a point, but I think the issue is serious enough that we need to consider it. Um, so that's kind of the, the outline there. Um, it has something to do with the attention economy, and, and Facebook is very good at it, and Twitter is very good at it. Most of our apps are very blippy. The reason they're blippy is that if they blip up and you respond to that, you provide an eye for whatever ad comes next, which is what gives them money. It might be free service, but it's not. They have bought you. You are the product. Yeah? Um, and while you're on their app, you're not, not, not on someone else's app. That's the attention economy. right? Please be aware of it. Try to avoid it by putting that away, turning notifications off. Like, I do have Facebook, but I use it in a web browser. It will not blip at me. It can't. It also won't read my contacts, which is really good. Yeah? So there's, there's reasons for that. I will only use it in a browser that doesn't actually spread its tentacles across the rest of my phone. Um, and I prefer to not help enable it by, you know, I'm not in that space right now, but I, I will not help other people build things that, that feed into the detention economy thing. It just seems like a bad idea. So that's my... My proposal to, to my fellow geeks who do build things for people, please, please don't help enable it because it's, it's technically interesting, but it's probably not good for the planet. So, you know, on that level. Now, I'm also almost out of time, I think. I've got about one minute left. This is what I want to be doing in the coming time. And this is not just me, but, you know, over, the, over time people have talked to me about this. Um, we need new stickers, obviously. Yeah, obviously we need new stickers and we need to send them all over the place, so maybe post out more, a couple of stamps. Um, I would like psychologists and, and counselors available at many more events, like at this event, for instance. Yeah? It, it was short notice, effectively, because I had so many other things to do, and I don't expect the, L, the LCA gang to kind of take care of that per se. It's, it's a bit of a job and takes some special attention in a certain way. So it's things that need to be organized, but. Primarily, it needs funding because that psychologist doesn't need to be paid. Yeah, it's somewhere between five hundred and a thousand dollars for a couple of days, and that means that you need to do, you know, you know, we need to do a bit of crowdsourcing for that, um, or crowdfunding for that. Previously, we've had some some contributions from Linux Australia, but if we're doing this for a lot of conferences, of course, that's not viable. I think we can manage between ourselves to make that available for our friends. I think that's entirely doable. A couple of dollars each, and we're there, right? Um, so that's what I like to happen, and LCA, PyCon, and the many other events, at least around Australia and New Zealand. Maybe beyond, but let's deal with that right now. There are other organizations that do similar things in other countries, and they can, they can do their thing. Ongoing crowdfunding to deal with those things. Possible t-shirts, which any profits of which we can just toss at the crowdfunding uh, destination. That money needs to be managed somewhere, and I've got into trouble with PayPal, and there's currently about $350 stuck in PayPal because I ticked the wrong box at some point, and we need to drag it out. Um, that's a paperwork issue, but what the solution would be is to be a Linux Australia subcommittee. Then we get our own bank account and can actually manage this. For that, we need to have a number of people who will actually be on that committee and help organize that, and preferably active, because I can't do it all on my own. So please talk to me about that. We obviously need this to happen. Will you help? Thank you very much. A couple of quick questions, you, perhaps. Uh, um, yeah, I'm not sure when we're going to be kicked out, so maybe.
try and get one or two questions. Yeah. Otherwise, we can walk out and do questions anyway. Thank you. So um, I find this talk particularly interesting and relevant towards me because um, in my normal day job, I am a high school teacher at an all-girls school. Okay. So I teach girls uh, between the ages of 12 to 18. Um, something that I have noticed, and it's kind of a, a personal sort of take on it, is um, what I call the the best self uh, the best self effect. So I find that a lot of girls in particular are under a lot of pressure to uh, try and uh, be their best self. And it's not just in terms of, you know, when they're going out and they're with their friends and things like that. But now with the rise of the ubiquity of smartphones and everything, yes. they're under that pressure all of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so therefore, when, you know, even when they're at home, they can't just sort of relax and go splat and things like that. They, you know, they get particularly with things like uh, Instagram and Snapchat, yeah. there's this constant pressure to look your best, uh, look like you're living your best life and all of this kind you're, of you're thing. You're performing all the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so uh, permanently being on stage, which I feel yes. um, exacerbates that, uh, yes. that type of anxiety. Yeah. Something that I find a little bit disturbing in our education system at the moment is the, um, is the encouragement and the implementation of the use of iPads and yes. tablets, particularly in the middle school, so yes. years seven to nine range, because for me, they seem to be a bit too close to the, in the same environment as smartphones. Yes. And so therefore, you know, I find that uh, in my own classroom practice, I'm constantly having to tell kids, uh, lock your screen, put your iPad away. Mm -hmm. And it's gotten to the point where I just get them to stack them up at the front of my classroom because they get them out without realizing. Um, yeah. Another notable incident that I had was, um, yeah, there was one girl in particular who, you know, year nine, age 14, just totally addicted to her smartphone. So I just, I took it off her. I put it in my bag, I placed my bag at the front of the classroom, and then for the next hour, every five minutes, she kept asking me, have you still got my phone? And the interesting thing is the attitude that, um, you know, that FOMO thing where they don't feel the need to check their social media, but they feel the need to keep up with their social media. Yeah. So is that it, sound, it, sounds like, it sounds like an addiction response though. Yeah, yeah, Very exactly. much so, yeah. Um, so I'm not sure if that's um, if that's something that I believe in our current education system that you know is beneficial. Should we be giving them these tools, or you know, and it, because it's I find it's really difficult to tr uh, teach them how to treat them as tools rather than a substitute for their phone. Well, I'm not on my phone. I'm on my iPad, kind of thing. Yes. Um... Well, there was the Open Education Mini Conference yesterday, yeah. <laughs> which covered mon some of those things. Um, from my observation and conversation with other people, including teachers, teachers yesterday, um, I think the consensus is that availability of any tech, whether it's a tablet or, or a laptop in a classroom, does not actually improve educational outcomes. Like a hammer. The fact that you have a hammer in the room doesn't actually make anybody a carpenter, nor does it actually improve the general atmosphere in the room or the outcomes. It may or may not. It can be really useful as a tool, but the fact that you have them doesn't help. So why do schools acquire them? Well, because you have to, because the neighbors do it and you look cool. And, and if you have iPads instead of some other brand X, then you are cooler because you're, you look more snazzy and so on. Funnily enough, sales of iPads in schools peaked in 20... 15, 16, and is vast on the decline in the US. Some trend pew, peaked and went off. All the people who were completely obsessed with them got over themselves and there were no new ones getting bought. And it's not just schools no longer buying new ones because usually the, the laptop or the tablet, go, the tablet goes with the kid, which means that anyone coming new into the school would need a new tablet. So the fact that the sales have declined while the population is still growing means that there's definitely a downward trend on schools using it. The schools have got over it. In Australia, we haven't peaked yet, it seems, because I've still seen schools do this. And you talk about year seven to nine. I know BYO iPad primary schools where all the year fives and possibly younger 
all have their own iPad. Now, admittedly, those are rich kids from rich parents mostly, but nevertheless, you know, nevertheless, somehow that school felt compelled to acquire a heck of a lot of iPads for, for the kids at school. And I really don't see the point. Yes, they can do cool stuff with it, but does it actually in improve the outcomes? No, measurably not. And there are schools who have now completely refused to use any laptops. And I think those kids will come out just fine too. I think it's a step too far because being, you know, keyboard, mouse, and generally computer literate is really important. So completely excluding tech from the classroom is probably a really bad idea. But the way they're in the classroom now, they have to be there because you have to. That's a very bad pedagogical reason, obviously. Yeah, Does that true. make sense? And uh, yeah, from that pedagogical perspective, I've found that it's really interesting. A lot of kids aren't, uh, they're not learning information or memorizing facts. They're memorizing how to Google those facts. Yep. But they're not, in fact, laying down new information in their long-term memory. So I think overall, yes. that sort of tech, particularly in that you know, touchscreen, iPad uh, environment, mm -hmm. is actually becoming an educational impediment. Yes. Um, I had a slide up yesterday. There's research. Um, the, the pen is mightier than the laptop. Um, there's an actual paper um, that contains that, that phrase. Um, I think it might even be the title. And the test was whether people, how people remember a lecture when they don't make any notes at all or make notes and throw the piece of paper away or make notes and check the piece of paper later or make notes on a laptop and review it. The ones that made a laptop, notes on the laptop did worse than the people that made notes on the piece of paper and threw it away. So why bother? It, uh, as to exactly why, it, it, it is thought that perhaps uh, people are paying lots of attention to you know, the formatting and other things on the computer, so they're kind of distracted. But whatever the reason, doing notes on a laptop is not worthwhile. You might as well not do them. And I see in LinuxConf, not just in this conference, but at other conferences, that more and more people are actually using a pen and paper. Whether they've read the paper or not, I don't know, but they've actually discovered that they actually get better results rather than using that. And then there's a better retention, which, as we know, is important. If you write it down, it helps your brain cement the, the memory. So yes, using less tech is probably a good thing. One more question, I think, there, and then we should wrap it up. OK, can we, can we have the microphone there? Thank you. And that will be the last one, and then we'll just walk out and, and yap some more. Just out of interest, so Karen, you know, when people read a story on a piece of paper versus on a screen, you know, who has the better recall of what they've actually just read? I don't quite understand the question. No, reading a book on the screen versus like you're yeah, re reading a, oh, a book right. on a tablet or just reading the same story on a piece of paper. Who can recall more facts about what they've just I, read? I don't know. That's a very interesting thing. So, so yeah, Sorry. that's a very interesting I thing. I, I don't know. Um, in, when I was a lot younger, last century, um, <laughs> I participated in a psych study in yep. primary school where they yes. showed black and white movie and then a colour movie and yes. um, the recall amongst all us kids and I went and looked at the paper later, the recall amongst the kids for the black and white film yes. was a lot more than the colour. Yes, um, I know that. Is, yep. yeah, which is a similar kind of thing. The problem is though of course that um, I will make a lot more money selling 100 laptops than 100 pieces of paper. I know. And that's the main problem. Yes, however being, being a parent I'd rather buy lots of more pieces of paper. And being a government, you can save a lot of money by not buying all these tablets, particularly not of brand X. Um, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's something to consider. I'm not saying no laptops or whatever. I mean, this is not a let's all toss our phones in the canal. It, it, that's not what it's about. Um, but, you know, more sensible approaches to uses. And there's tools for that. What's that, sorry? We do not want to be doing that, I think. Um, anyway, thank you very much. Right, thank you, uh, Arian. I think. <laughs>